So tonight's lecture is about sequencing and then uh, SNP discovery and variation, but it's actually really kind of three or four topics all crammed together. Um, I am probably going to talk, as Bill said, I will probably talk for about three and a half hours or so. Um, so we will take a break, don't worry. <laughs> so first I'm going to talk about next generation sequencing technologies, whether you call them next gen or second generation or third generation or fourth generation is at this point kind of somewhat arbitrary. It's not like, it's not like the cell phone technology where they roll it out and they tell you what the brand is. Um, it just sort of happens. So we'll get into it. So here's where we're at today in 2015, the steady increase in um, megabase of sequence per thousand dollars of expenditure. So we started back in 2003 with Sanger sequencing and, and you know, uh, laboratory farms of of ABI sequencers churning out sequence for the Human Genome Project, the, the Drosophila genome, the yeast genome, lots of different bacterial genomes. This sad, poor little dot back here was, you know, really the beginning of a huge field of computational biology. So even though we're all very excited about being up here, we can't forget what has gone before. 454 um, pyrosequencing, which is the first technology that we'll talk about tonight, was first in the field in 2005 or so. And again, this kind of looks like a, you know, this looks like a small little blip compared to the activity that's happened more recently, but this was a monstrously huge quantum leap in, in our ability to do high throughput large scale sequencing in a way that, remember, this dot is here and there's no other dot below it, right? If we made, if, if we continue this graph back, it would be pretty flat. Right, all the other all the other years before that, um, not really much happened. There was some uh, some improvement in throughput in terms of making these these machines more efficient and and and, and able to uh, you know, mass produce. But these kind of this kind of logarithmic or you know exponential scale up in the amount of sequence that can be produced for the same um, uh, for the same money has been uh, pretty. Impressive, and it continues, right? And so it's not clear that you know this this continues to go up and up and up. And so, you know, when when you are all when you all are actually giving these lectures in, an, in another you know four or five years, you know we'll be up here somewhere, and you'll be telling us about what the what the next technologies are. So we're going to talk about four five four. Um, we're going to talk about Illumina sequencing, and a lot of the dots on here are just essentially further improvements to the Illumina sequencing platform. Uh, that have continued to improve the, 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 the output per, per dollar. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about ion torrent, um, but really the take home message is ion torrent is just 454 <coughs> with, a, with a better detection uh, technology. And then we'll talk about the new kids on the block, or the relatively new kids on the block. We'll talk about PacBio um, and, and Oxford Nanopore. And this is a really interesting graph. This came from one of uh, Lear Pactor's uh, PhD students. This is this is his essentially his his uh, a figure out of his out of his thesis. Um, and what he's done is he's scaled the size of the bubble, uh, the size of, of 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 each of these circles by the length of the reads. You can see that these are the biggest bubbles, and they have the longer reads. 454 has longish reads. Sanger actually has has longer reads than than 454. Illumina and also Solid up here have relatively shorter reads, and we'll talk about that. And then the other thing he's done, which is kind of cute, is just as a visualization technique, the outlines of each circle, the width of that outline is proportional to the error rate. Okay, so the error rate on PacBio and Oxford Nanopore is much larger than the error rates on these other guys. And so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. And so it'll be interesting to see as things evolve. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work going on at PacBio right now for a new PacBio sequencer, whether it's going to move up here or whether it's just going to move over here but have a much smaller, um, much smaller outline or, or much, you know, thinner outline. It'll be interesting. Is that ratio per length? You know, so you'd expect more errors for a longer read, right? So is there a ratio? Well, we'll look at that. Yeah. We'll look at that. Yeah, maybe. That, that, that might be a natural interpretation, but, but not, not necessarily. Okay, and so here's just, just another way of looking at that in a, in a tabular form and, and just getting, giving you some, some numbers. Um, people like to talk a lot about how long it takes to, to, to get a particular amount of, of, of sequence. I've always found this a little bit artificial. 
I'm happy to wait two weeks to get sequenced because it's going to take me another six months to analyze it and think about it and go to the next step anyway. So whether something is done in a day or it's done in two weeks is something that a large scale sequencing center that has or, or, or a vendor who has thousands of clients has to worry about, but it's not something that as a scientist I, I, I necessarily have to care about. So, in, um, so I'm going to kind of speed through these, the, these things, but, but please stop me if, if you have questions. So the first sequencing technology to talk about is uh, the 454 Pyrus sequencing. 454 was eventually purchased <coughs> by, by Roche, and uh, unfortunately now has actually been, been shut down. As of, as of 2013, they, they've discontinued their line, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about their, that, that later. But it's a good place to start because it's a good place to start thinking about some of the technology. So fundamentally, every sequencing uh, technology starts with some kind of DNA sequence library preparation step, and we'll talk uh, a fair amount about this. So uh, in this case, you start with uh, some DNA sample that then gets fragmented, um, whether by nebulization or by shear force or, 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 or some sort of uh, either, either biophysical or, or chemical process. The DNA gets broken up into smaller pieces, um, double-stranded. There's a ligation reaction in, in which different uh, controlled sequence, uh, pr probe sequences are ligated onto either end of the fragment. This is a blunt-ended ligation. And then there's a selection step, in this case a, a, a avidin uh, biotin sort of uh, selection where we're going to isolate any um, individual single-stranded DNA fragment that has both the A oligo and the B oligo ligated to it. So this now is the sort of first step of library prep. You now have a single-stranded template DNA library, which is a bunch of these you know, uh, mostly purified, you know, somehow probably 90% pure population of sequences of, of, of single-stranded DNA that has both the A oligo and the B oligo on either end. The next step then is this um, PCR reaction, this oil emulsion droplet PCR reaction where um, in a, you know, aqueous oil mixture, which is vortexed, rapidly, um, also containing these beads, you get these small um, aqueous droplets that are just a little bit bigger than the size of these beads. Okay, so there's an excess of DNA capture beads such that within in, in any one droplet, there is most of the time no DNA. Most droplets that have a bead have no DNA in them. And then once in a small while, because there, there's a gross excess of beads and a gross excess of droplets relative to DNA, you have one and only one uh, <coughs> molecule of the single-stranded DNA there. And because it has both of these oligos on either end, one of those oligos is complementary to a probe that's on the bead, and so it anneals to the bead. Right? Then you, it also has the um, uh, polymerase enzyme and the uh, uh, nucleotides in the emulsion such that when you now do regular PCR thermal cycling, you get many, many copies of that single clonal template made, and each of those copies can now stick to the bead. And so at the end of the day, you now have a bead that has, you know, hundreds of thousands of copy of the same original template DNA annealed to that bead. Does that make sense? Now. What can happen? What can, what can go wrong with this picture? Once in a while, there can be two fragments, and then you're going to have a polyclonal bead, and that's going to be a problem. Um, the other problem I, I already alluded to is that lots of time you get no DNA okay, in, in the bead, and so, the, and so that's essentially a, a wasted bead. The last step there is, is to then essentially break the emulsion and do some sort of selection based on that other sticky end um, to get those beads that are actually DNA positive. But like every purification step, every selection step, you know, there's some false positive and false negative rate for that. Okay. The last step then is to plate these beads out in a, in a nano tighter, um, you know, nano well plate where each of the wells is only big enough to fit one and only one bead. And this is another process where most of the wells get one bead, some of the wells get zero beads, and once in a while two beads happen to get stuck into the same well, because again, it's, a, it's not a, a perfect process. But again, at the end of the day, you have this honeycomb of, of, 
of wells in which you now have, most of the time when things are going well, one bead that's coated with many hundred thousand copies of the same DNA that has been PCR amplified. So the PCR ampl amplification has some kind of error rate in it, maybe you know, one in 10,000, one in 100,000 error rate, but those errors are going to be randomly distributed. You know, any one copy might have some errors in it, but overall the majority at any given position, the, the majority is that they all have the same uh, as the original template DNA. Then a little bit of enzymatics within each well, we can have a, 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 a sort of a fluidics cycling operation where um, given the, uh, polymerase in that well and given an, uh, a primer that's complementary to, to, to one, of those, one of those oligos that we ligated on, we could then float in uh, um, dideoxynucleotides and if the dideoxynucleotide that we float into the, to the well is complementary to the next base in the template, then it will get incorporated. Right? So if we float in T here, the T will be complementary to that A, will get incorporated into this, into this growing second chain, and that will, will release pyrophosphate. The pyrophosphate will then be, um, uh, essentially drive the, um, uh, sorry, ATP sulfurylase converts the pyrophosphate to ATP in the presence of adenosine 5 phosphosulfate. I'm not an enzymologist. In previous years, I didn't have all this text up here, and I had to try to remember it. This way, I actually get it right, and you can go home and, and actually um, tell all your friends about it, too. So, so the really, but, but essentially, the reason it's called pyrosequencing is because we're releasing that pyrophosphate. This pyrophosphate drives an enzymatic reaction that ultimately ends up using the cyphrase to generate light. And so you have a microscope now that is essentially positioned over that, over this plate to now look at each well and say, how much light did I now observe? Okay, in that, uh, you know, in, at that particular cycle. So now what we're going to do is then in multiple fluidic cycle, we're going to float in A, then C, then G, you know, we're going to float in A, observe the light, then wash it all out and shut it down. Then we're going to float in C, observe the light, wash it all out, shut it down, et cetera, et cetera, cycle after cycle. And we're going to put in A, C, G, T, A, C, G, T. And the idea is for any one given well, for any given well, we're going to get what's called a flow gram, which um, in most of the cycles, which are these little dots down here where there's not a line going up, nothing happens. There's no light. Okay? And because the amount of light produced is proportional to the amount of pyrophosphate that's released, then we get this kind of stair step sort of thing where if a single base is incorporated, if there was one um, uh, base to extend, then you get essentially one quantum step approximately of, of, of light. But if there were actually two A's in a row or two C's in a row, then you get twice as much incorporation because the first base incorporates and then the second base incorporates after that. Okay, so it's really easy to distinguish single base incorporations from no base incorporations. And then it's pretty easy to distinguish two base from one base incorporations, and probably even three versus two, but then things get a little bit fuzzy, because if you go to four or five or six, first of all, there's the fact that they're relatively rare. And because they're rare, it means that, that the, the signal processing algorithm that has to parse through all this and figure out, well, where's the, where's the line that distinguishes between one and two? Where's the line that distinguishes between three and four? Where's the line that distinguishes between eight and nine? When you really might only have two examples of an eight or a nine in a given run, it's hard for the software to actually figure out where that's going to be. So the overwhelming um, problem with 454 is that um, the accuracy is actually very, very good for one MERS and two MERS, but as things get longer, the error rate gets uh, increasingly higher. So this so-called long ho uh, homo polymers, it gets it correct that there were, you know, that there were a string of A's, for example, in a row, but whether there were five A's or six A's or three A's or seven A's is, you know, can be, can be questionable. And the longer those homo polymers are, the harder it is for, for a 454 to be able to distinguish it. Okay, does that make sense? So it was the first uh, commercially available next generation sequencing platform. It had long reads, and in fact, because this, 
this process, this flow gram, um, can go on very, very long without degrading the, the um, signal. Um, you get about a million reads per plate. It was fairly expensive, both in terms of the machine itself and then the, um, the, the reagents used. Um, as I said, the homopolymer error rate is, is high. It was and still, you know, vaguely is being used for metagenomics and bacterial genomic uh, resequencing. Since we're here at Cold Spring Harbor, I always have to say Jim Watson's genome was sequenced on the 454 entirely. It was the second human genome sequenced um, after, after Craig Venters. And, um, and it was essentially sequenced for about a million dollars on the, on, the, on the 454, which at the time was an incredible achievement. Um, 2013, Roche discontinued the 454 product line. People that still have the machines can, I, I believe, still get reagents for it, but, um, but they're certainly not selling new machines, and it's, it's, you know, most shops are kind of closing down that, uh, that production. But you will still run into 454 data, particularly if you're in the kind of metagenomic space and looking back to sort of reanalyze older data sets. So any questions about that before we forge ahead? Right. So the next thing to talk about is Illumina. <coughs> Illumina is the, um, not just the elephant in the room, but the monster in the building. Um, incredibly successful technology. Uh, I like to remind people that, that Illumina was actually, was actually a genomics biotechnology company before sequencing. They did, they did microarrays, they did SNP chips, um, using a very ingenious little bead array technology. But now most people have name recognition for Illumina because of sequencing, and that sequencing came from a, a British company called Selexa. Um, it starts off the same way you have fragmented uh, DNA, usually smaller fragments, much smaller fragments, 200 base pair or so fragments of DNA that you, again, uh, adapters get ligated to this. And now the idea is that rather than mixing those single-stranded DNA templates with a bunch of beads and, and having the beads separate out the DNA, now we're going to essentially plate them out on a glass slide. And it's a, and it's a glass slide that has already been pre-coated with complementary, you know, with a, essentially a lawn of, um, of spatially separated uh, complementary oligos to those, to those adapters that got, that got annealed on. Okay? And I always like to explain this because I think of it this way. It's like plating out E. coli or yeast. You're going to plate it out at a at a, you know, spare, you know, at a, at, a, at a low enough density that you can allow individual colonies to grow up. And that's exactly the sort of thing that's going to happen here. So here on this plate, you can hopefully see that there's, you know, here's a single uh, uh, molecule of, of DNA that's annealed. And then spatially separated on the plate is another molecule, and here's another molecule. And in between, there's nothing. Then what they're going to do is a series of PCR reactions that essentially, because the fragment is in that 200 base pair window, and because of the density of the lawn of these primers, the thermodynamics is such that you can get that molecule to, while it's waving around, actually anneal to the other primer, and now you can have PCR occur across that, across that, that, that bridge. So this is so-called bridge amplification. And the, you know, the, the, the daughter product then, uh, essentially because as it's being, as that second strand of DNA is being produced, there's a lawn of primers right next to it, thermodynamically, you know, anneals almost instantly to the most closest primer, and now you end up having two molecules that are attached. This is just after the first cycle, you've gone from one to two, and of course you do many, many more cycles, and now you have what are essentially colonies of, or they're called polonies, because um, they're because they're PCR products, um, but polonies of spatially set, you know, physically spatially separated uh, PCR products from those from those original templates. Having done that, and now having rather than a than a you know bead coated with with a hundred thousand molecules of now you have essentially these individual little spots that may have. I don't know, 10,000 to 50,000 DNA copies. Um, now you can do a set of cycling reactions where using, again, dideoxy and fluorescently labeled, in this case, we're using different colors for each of the four different nucleotides, uh, 
Um, in each cycle, we can float in all four different nucleotides, and we can snap a picture. Okay? And for any given, uh, for any given uh, polony, it will essentially incorporate one and only one nucleotide because it's, it's dideoxy on the other side, so it's, 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 it's blunted from, from, um, from continuing on. It can only incorporate one nucleotide. So, it, so in case there is a homopolymer, it can't... So in the, in the 454 situation, when you floated in uh, when you floated, when you floated in adenine, and if there were three adenines, they would incorporate all three of them and release three pyrophosphates. Here, it can only incorporate one because it's the 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 chain is 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 essentially blocked. Um, so floats in one, we snap a picture of it, and the fluorescence of it uh, tells us essentially which residue got incorporated at that particular cycle. So now we can essentially watch the, the, the pollinase from cycle to cycle to cycle to cycle. And for any one given uh, polony, we can read off the sequence then. This was yellow, so that was G. Then it was C, then it was T, then it was G, then it was A. And that gives us the, the sequence. Okay. So this is a somewhat idealized sort of picture here. You can actually tell up here, again, just like a bacterial plate or a yeast plate, sometimes the colonies, sometimes the pollinase are very close to each other. Sometimes you can have a colony that grows really big and actually kind of blebs off and looks maybe like it's another colony, but it really actually is the same colony. Okay, so those sorts of optical artifacts can exist, and later we'll talk about repeat, uh, uh, looking at, at duplicates, reads that seem to be exactly the same and come from exactly the same thing, and often that is because of this sort of optical illusion where the software is tricked into thinking that two different dots are actually two separate colonies when they were actually the same. So, so we, we call those uh, uh, optical duplicates. So a lot of the sort of fancy footwork in, for the Illumina comes in the sort of image recognition and, and the um, you know, sort of deconvolution of these images into where are the actual spots where are the separate spots, then as you go cycle, cycle, what's the color that we're actually seeing in each, in each cycle? So any, any questions about how that works? How many people have heard this before? How many people already know exactly how this all works? It's all just boring. Yeah, go ahead. How does the blocking work? Yeah, or the unblocking rather. Yeah. Yeah, so, the, so I, I'll be honest, I don't remember the enzymology. Next year I'll put that up there on the, on the, on the slide too. But yeah, yeah, so, it, so, it's, so, so there, you know, it, it, the, the in-between arrow, this little arrow here, there's, a, there's an unblocking, you know, there's a washout, there's an unblocking, there's a fix-up step, and then it goes on, right? And that's actually one of the issues of this particular technology is that in the first couple cycles, everything is going along swimmingly. Because here you have 99.99% efficiency, only 0.1% of it doesn't unblock or doesn't incorporate, right? Because you have this issue of, of all of them, you, you don't actually get 100% incorporation and you don't actually get 100% unblocking. So at every step you have this kind of lag where in the next cycle, there may be a small number of molecules that are actually one step behind. And an even smaller number of molecules that are two steps behind or maybe three steps behind. And that's not a problem in the first 40 or 50 cycles, but by the time you get out to 100 cycles, that kind of small, you know, that 0.1%, that 0.1%, at 0.1% start to add up to a significant signal, where now instead of getting a nice clear yellow dot, you're getting kind of a brown dot, because it's a combination of G and T and C that's coming in, because they're all out of phase with, with respect to each other. So that's, that's why Illumina reads are essentially limited. So there's two reasons why, why Illumina reads are limited to their size. One is that this bridge amplification process, if you put in a uh, 1,000 base pair molecule, <coughs> that molecule has so much entropy that it doesn't really like to bridge. Okay, so the, molecule, the, the, the fragment itself has to be small enough that biophysically it can, it can tolerate making that, that, that bridge structure. But the other reason is that you know, as you get out to increasingly long um, cycles, that phasing problem becomes more and more of an, of an issue. Is there another question? I have a question regarding the size of the so-called spot. Does it reflect the number of reads <coughs> or not? No. Any one spot is going to give you one read. 
right? So, I've, so, so this is a very small fraction of the overall glass slide. The, the, the glass slide is going to have hundreds of millions of spots on it. And every single one of those spots, one spot is going to turn into one read. So here, for example, here's one spot. Here's just a little tiny chip of, a little tiny piece of the overall slide. It has four spots on it, four different colonies. And one of those colonies reads off G, C, T, G, A, and that is one read. Yeah, one read, but maybe I'm, I'm asking, using wrong linguistics, uh, does the size of the so-called colony, does it reflect number of uh, strains? It is the number of strands on there, yeah. But, but, but essentially what we're going to do is we want to make the spot big enough that, that, the, that the image recognition software can see it, but not so big that it starts to bleed into the next spot. Right? And this is kind of a kind of density issue, right? So the, the more dense that you, can, that you can spot that slide, the more reads you're going to get for any given reaction, right? So I could have, you know, we could have pipetted this at a much lower density and had only one spot. On the, you know, in, this, in this given area. And that's fine, we get one read, but that's a lot of wasted real estate. Good question, yeah. Um, yeah, so I know that once it calls a cluster at a particular location, then it's going to incorporate a base every time, like whether or not it sees, it, or I'm asking about this part though. So, so if it see, if the color is like off, it's brown like you suggested, it calls it, it calls it as a nucleotide though, right? It doesn't, it like says some letter, it chooses Right, and it has like a tendency toward, toward a particular nucleotide. Is that true? Excellent. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So there are certain kinds of, of mismatches, certain kind of errors that Illumina will tend to make, and it's not it's not homogenous. So so for example, so as you can see, early in the read, the error rate is very low. But then this guy, which is the T to G transition, and again, I apologize, I can't remember. Maybe T is the right one and it makes G instead, or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe T is the error and G is what it's supposed to have, have been. The point is that they're not homogenous. Um, and a lot, some of that comes from the sort of spectral emission overlap between the different colors. Some of it comes from issues of GC bias and, and the sort of enzymatics. You know, when, you know, this kind of lagging phase you know, out of phase effect is different for different kinds of sequences, at, at, you know, depending on, on, the, on the GC composition. But so, once it gets, so like once the color gets sort of bad enough that it can't figure out what it thinks is the dominant uh -huh. color, it will report N. Exactly. Exactly in. right. Okay. So homopolymer okay. error, uh, so 454 error, and also anytime, I, so just anytime, just give up, give up the, the punchline. Anytime I say 454, just mentally replace that with ion torrent, okay? Because they are the same technology. Um, uh, the kinds of, er when people talk about error rates in ion torrent or 454, it's all about indels. It's all about homopolymer, the length of that homopolymer. The base substitution rate is very low, less, less than 1%. Okay? With Illumina, it's more about substitution rate and less about, about indels. Okay? Although there is still a possibility for, for indels, but they are correspondingly much rarer than, than the base substitution. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, um, not so much of an issue anymore, but it used to be an issue. A, a major question people would always ask is, fine, 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 how many lanes do I need to run? Because people were at, you know, like I, my sequencing core told me, told me it was, it was you know, $2,000 per lane. But I've got 12 samples, so what does that mean? How many, do I need to do 12 lanes? Do I, you know, what do I need to do? And um, this slide used to be more complicated because it depended on, well, what was your sequencer and, and how many, you know, how many reads did you want and how many reads could you get out of a, out of a lane? It's not the case anymore. Now every single core lab or vendor who's going to do the sequencing for you has the capability to barcode every one of your samples for you know, pennies on the dollar. Um, and so if you have 20 samples, you give them 20 samples, they put 20 barcodes on it. Um, and then the question is really just how, much, how many reads per sample do you want? Do you want 10 million reads? Do you want 50 million reads? Do you want 100 million reads? And then depending on how many reads you want, then the sequencing core, and depending on what machine they have, they're going to just spread it out over however many lanes 
they can or, they, or, they, or that they need to to satisfy your request. So it's not so much of, a, of an issue anymore for most modern labs. If your school or, or, or institution is you know, still a little bit behind the times and they're not barcoding and they're still in a mode of saying, well, your samples have to go in, in you know, each of your samples is going to go into one lane and so you're going to get whatever amount of sequence we generate out of that one lane then I would essentially challenge them and say, well, why aren't you barcoding? Because it's just ridiculous at this point not to be. Okay? No, so, so at the end of the day, um, uh, the question is, is how many of these, how many of these, of these spots are you, are, you gonna, are you going to generate? Okay, and so I know that on a given, you know, on, on a given physical glass tile, um, I'm going to play, I'm going to play it out such that I'm going to get 100 million spots, let's just say, right? And if you give me five samples and you want 20 million spots, you know, you want 20 million reads on average approximately per sample, then I say, great, I'm going to barcode your samples and I'm going to run them on one lane and I'm going to get 100 million reads and when we use the barcodes to now split them up, you're going to get approximately 20 million reads per sample. So I guess, so, so what, is in, what is in this, this big table is the sort of, you know, expected output uh, in terms of reads, you know, so, so this is my, my frustration with all of these promotional materials is that they always give you it in the total number of bases uh, the calculation you then have to do is, well, if I'm doing 100 base pair reads versus 50 base pair reads, and that's half as many bases, but still the same number of reads, same number of, of fragments that you're sequencing. Yes, Danny. Can you say any error uh, estimates with the new maps of the molecule? No. I don't know anything about that. Okay. For what? Two. Four. You just need two. No, no. <laughs> Before you said like how many lanes do I need to run? It's like oh, it depends on how many. We're gonna look at that later. So when, so when we talk about RNA seq and we talk about genome assembly and we talk about so we're gonna talk about SNPs tonight. There you're gonna talk about having how much coverage. You know, 40x, 50x, 100x coverage, depending on whether you're genotyping or de novo SNP discovery. So it depends on your application. Okay, real quickly, I'm going to talk about solid, although I'm not actually going to go through all of it, um, but um, the, the, the take-home message with solid, and, the, and, and this is a technology that does still exist, it's pretty rare, um, it is incredibly cheap, right? Illumina is expensive because these uh, fluorescently labeled uh, nucleotides, so besides Illumina selling you the machine for a few gazillion dollars, they then, every single time you run, you have to buy these reagents for them. So it's kind of like the whole, the whole sort of razor blade thing. You know, you, you, you know, you get the razor blade, but then the replacement razors are, are what, uh, what is, is the most uh, expensive thing. So Illumina gets you coming and going. Um, with solid, the idea is, is that now instead of using, um, uh, instead of using uh, fluorescently labeled nucleotides, they have these, these oligoprobes that have a, um, uh, that, 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 that also have a, a uh, fluorescent probe on the end, but these are essentially much cheaper to make. So the reagent cost is, is, is like two orders of magnitude cheaper for, for um, solid. And the way this works here is this is a, a essentially a, a hybridization, a, a kind of annealing and extending process. And so the way this works is a little confusing is you have a bunch of different, you have a bunch of different primers, a bunch of different probes in which the first two bases are known and then the next three bases are essentially random, not random hexamers, but random, um, <coughs> random trimers, I guess. Yes, random trimers. And then the following three bases are three bases that cannot, that, that cannot um, hybridize. Okay? So that's kind of weird. And then the color of the, f of the, of the uh, fluorescent probe is based on this weird table of, of dinucleotide pairings. So if I have an A and an A, then that's blue. Or if I have T and a T, that's blue. But if I have, if I have T and a G, then that's green. But if I have a C and a G, then that's red, et cetera. Right? So you have two, so you have four times four, 16 different, 16 different dinucleotide sequences. Um, but only four different colors and then this table. Okay, so that, that's the first thing that's a little bit weird. 
Um, then the idea is that, so you have your, uh, your polymerase um, set up here. Uh, sorry, not polymerase. You have your hybridization set up here. And now if the next template sequence is TA, then your red, uh, your red AT primer can hybridize. Okay, and, and emit a little bit of, of red light when you now excite it with the laser. Any bit of, um, any bit of, of template DNA that, that did not bind uh, <coughs> to this gets capped. Then you cleave off the, this kind of extra bit at the end that I said would not hybridize. And so now you've, you've recognized red. You don't really know which of these four it was. In this case, I'm telling you that it's AT, but all you really got to see was that red uh, flash. Could have been any four of those. Um, and now you've gone three base pairs out, um, and now you're going to now go again into another cycle. And so essentially, at each cycle, you're going to read off a color um, in that spot. Right? So just like, just like Illumina spots, solid has spots. You're going to read off the color at each spot. But you're only going to see the color. You're going to see red, then blue, then, then yellow, then green, then blue, then green, then red. And you're not going to know which of these it is. OK? So that sounds like <laughs> great. <laughs> I've sort of sequenced it, but not, not. But you've actually gotten a little bit of, of, of information. You now, know, um, you now know that at this position, these two bases are one of these four bases. So that's reduced yourself from 16 possibilities to only four possibilities. <coughs> sounds good? Now what they do is they, oh sorry, I, I missed the end of the, now they get to the end and there's this, this whole primer reset where now we're going we're gonna to melt off that sequence. We're going to go back to the template and now instead of using the N uh, primary, now we're going to do the N minus 1 primer which anneals one base pair shifted backward to the left. Right? And so now we're going to go through the whole process again and now instead of getting that same red, blue, now we're going to get a different set of colors, A, A, D, 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 okay? You do that five different times with five different sets of primers, and now you get this kind of weird, um, staggered set of colors. But notice that every single base is now essentially sequenced twice. You get two separate reads on what that sequence is. Um, you collect the color images, you identify the beads, just like, and now you have this what's so-called color space, your red, green, blue, yellow. So that this is just like in the Illumina picture. We have, we have a given colony. We know the colors. This is now the color space, red, green, blue, yellow. But again, going back to this table, so fine. It goes from one of these reds to one of these greens to one of these blues to one of these yellows. But the magic is that if I know what even one of them is, if I know the beginning, um, then essentially I know how the transition is. If I know that the first base is A, then I know that if it's red, well, then the only thing that it can be is possibly T. Well, if that's T, then the first base here has to be T. And so then the next base has to be G. And if I know that that's G, then the next base has to be G, and so on and so forth. So you end up being able to decode from color space into base space. And that seems in, in, you know, in, uh, entirely convoluted. The advantage here is that the error rate, because you're, sequencing each, you're essentially sequencing each base twice, the error rate is incredibly low. And not only that, when you get particular um, color combinations, they can be indicative of a SNP, they can be indicative of some kind of measurement error, they can, you know, colors can tell you about deletions and insertions directly. So color space aware uh, uh, algorithms can essentially go through the color space data and figure out what's going on in a much more rigorous way than, than, than nucleotide base methods can go. Um, so. Really short reads, only 35 base pairs long or so. Very cheap cost, very high fidelity reads that makes it easy to detect certain types of, of sequencing error. Um, SNP discovery is the primary uh, application for this and the folks at, 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 at the Baylor Genome Center are actually doing a lot of this in a, in a clinical genome sequencing setting. They were essentially early adopters of the solid technology and I think they invested a lot of time and resource in, in, in uh, ironing out all the, all the wrinkles. I don't actually know of any other shops that are still using it, uh, but it does still exist. The biggest issue is this whole color space business. We have this incredible sweat, uh, suite of tools that we're going to talk about for the rest of the course. None of them know anything about color space. They do not deal in color space. Uh, 
They cannot calculate things in, in color space. And so essentially those, there's ways to convert tools from color space into base space and then continue on. But now you've just lost all your advantages that the, that the platform gave you in dealing with this kind of double, you know, double interrogated uh, sequence. Any questions about that? It knows the first base because of the, of the ligation in the first place, this, this, this adapter sequence. So that's why it shifted backwards. So essentially it's going to shift backwards so it sequences a little bit of the adapter in which you know what the sequence is. You know what the adapter sequence is going in. Yeah, good question though. Because it could have, instead of being n minus 1, it could have been n plus 1. It could have worked if it had just shifted it off to the right. Okay. Great. So other sequencing platforms that we've talked about in previous years that we no longer talk about. Um, Helicos uh, was a great idea, just like Illumina, um, but with no bridge amplification. Essentially, individual spots, where now the spot was a single piece of DNA on a glass slide with very ultra high resolution microscopy, such that in each cycle, as you floated in those fluorescent labeled uh, nucleotides, you would see the individual incorporation of a single nucleotide as a, as a very, very tiny flash of light. Okay? Um, uh, very sophisticated technology. The, the machines were outrageously expensive because of the sophistication of the, of the microscope and the kind of you know, scale at which it was, it was um, uh, measuring light. The, these things typically had to be housed in basements on granite slabs to you know, isolate vibrational um, issues. So they weren't, they weren't widely adopted. They had a great advantage that because there was no PCR amplification, you could look at extremely rare events. You could get 100 million, 500 million, a billion you know, reads off of a single glass slide and talk about things that, that occurred very, very rarely without worrying about PCR amplification introducing any particular biases. But it's gone, it's dead, don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, complete genomics was, was another kind of stealth technology that was around for a while. You could never buy a complete genomics machine. You could only send your DNA to them for sequencing. They had these uh, proprietary DNA nanoball arrays and combinatorial probe annealing ligated sequence by hybridization approach, which is essentially a, kind of like a tiling microarray where if you already knew what the sequence of the, of the genome was that, that you wanted to, to sequence, you could um, uh, you could do it that way. Again, I'm not going to go into great detail because the, uh, the Beijing Genomes Institute essentially bought the company and then shut down the technology entirely. So it's, it's gone. But at the time when it was operating, they, they, they claimed, and, and, I, and I, I know some people who, who actually use them, um, less than $2,000 a pop for a human genome at very low error rates. Again, the, the, the Illumina error rate is more like 1%. So, so very, very low low error rates because of the sequence by hybridization approach. Do you, do you know if these guys using that? Or what they've I think they've, my understanding, and I'm not in the kind of corporate vendor world, but my understanding is that they've moved to a more sort of commodity sequencing operation using Illumina and PacBio and you know, the other things that are out there, but, but on a massive scale. Well, and so I think the way the argument with, with complete genomics is because the error rate was so low, they didn't need 40x coverage. So what kind of coverage would they need? Uh, so again, I mean, you know, the uh, details were, were not very f oh. forthcoming because you know, essentially for the $2,000, you were going to get a VCF file full of SNPs. Well, so, but a lot of companies use that as a standard for describing how much it costs, I guess, but I don't know what they mean. I mean, obviously the human genome has an awesome, awesome way to use so you can have your reads and then see. Something that doesn't have a reference, you don't have really any reference to go by either. That's right. And because this is sequencing by hybridization, by definition, it required a reference. Right. So you could have never used this technology to sequence a new genome. Okay. Yeah. So are they I don't know. Yeah. No? Anybody familiar with this story? No? No? no. Okay, so um, the last one, and, and this kind of gets us back onto a sort of happy track of things that still exist. Um, is, is the ion torrent, first came out with the, with the uh, you know, personal uh, 
uh, uh, personalized genome module and proton machines. It's exactly like 454. It's emulsion PCR. It's the same steps in terms of coding a bead. Um, but now instead of using the enzymatics that, you know, pyrophosphate release that ends up releasing ATP that ends up driving luciferase to make light, now essentially all it's going to do is that, well, that pyrophosphate the release of pyrophosphate changes the pH of, the, of, that, of that well. And if you could just stick a little tiny pH meter into each of those million different wells, then you could measure the amount of pH change at each cycle. And then at the end of the cycle, you would float in some neutralizing buffer and you would put it back to where it's supposed to be and then go on to the next um, cycle. So that same flowgram I showed you where you were measuring the emission of, of, of light by the luciferase, you can instead measure, measure a delta pH. Well, that's, a, that's exactly what ion torrent does, um, but now it, it essentially uses a, um, a silicon wafer that has, a, you know, essentially a, an, an electronic circuit that is, that is exposed to the fluid and has individual microscopic little pH meters that in every single well measures the, the pH flux at each, at each cycle. So, there, so now that means that there's no microscope, and that's for for Helicos, for Lumina, for 454, for PacBio, that is the thing that makes the equipment expensive. It's, that micro, it's the fluidics, and it's the microscope, and it's the housing, and it's making that thing all work together and have all that stay stable and robust. So without a microscope, the machine, you know, and it's just, they're just silicone, sorry, not silicone, silicon. Um, they're just silicon wafers, right? So all the sort of computer chip manufacturing industry, all of the advances in you know, nanoscale fabrication can all be brought to bear to this uh, technology. Still a homopolymer problem with this? Still homopolymer problem, exact. Um, not quite as bad because it turns out that when you measure pH flux, you, so with light, you just kind of get this burst of light. You saw in the flow gram, it was just sort of a constant me metric of light. With the pH, you actually get kind of a trace. There's, there's, a, there's a spike and then there's a decay. And the decay actually provides a little bit more information, a little bit. So I mean, yes, it does still have a homer polymer problem. Instead of things getting bad at five or six, maybe it gets bad at eight or nine. Okay, great. So the newer kids on the block are PacBio, the Pacific Biosciences. Um, and this is single molecule real-time sequencing, single uh, or smart cells. Um, and I'll also talk about the Oxford nanopore. And there's a couple others that are out there. Um, I included in your, um, in the papers, a review from, from uh, Eric Schott, who's been you know, one of the sort of thought leaders in this, in this field. Um, so you can you know, read that at your, at your, at your leisure. And in a nutshell, and again, I'm, you know, this is going to be a little bit superficial in, in, in the interest of, of time, but what the PacBond machine does is has hundreds of thousands of, of nanopore wells, and at the bottom of that well is ligated, is, is, is bound, you know, f uh, physically bound, fixed, um, a very special polymerase, a polymerase that has been dumbed down. This polymerase um, is just really slow and its incorporation rate is really slow, such that if there's, a, if there's a, a, a template molecule that happened to get bound by it, uh, to stretch this pore, that as that molecule, uh, you know, essentially as this polymerase processes the molecule, um, it does so in such a slow way that if you're looking close enough, as each base gets incorporated, there can be a little flash of light that you can pick up on a video camera. Okay, so now we're not cycling, there's no cycling, there's not, you know, there's not this fluidic cycle of wash some stuff in, flash the laser, take a picture. It's now just a sort of real-time, constant video feed of, um, of this one enzyme with one molecule incorporating, um, incorporating nucleotides. So there is a laser shining at this thing, and if you shine the laser at the thing for long enough, the laser eventually just kind of melts the enzyme actually burns the enzyme. So one of the aspects of, of pack biosequencing is this kind of probing, uh, or, or um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the word. Somebody help me. When the lights go on and off, it's a strobe. strobe. Thank you. Not probe, strobe. 
<laughs> um, the, the idea of strobe sequencing in that, they turn the light on, you get to watch the video and see what nucleotides, and then you turn the light off. And while the light's off, more nucleotides go by. You don't get to see those, but you know for how long you kept the light off, and you know the average processing rate, so you can make some ideas about how long that particular gap might have been. Then you turn the light back on, and then you get some more reads. And if they actually have circular templates, then the circular template can go around and around multiple, multiple times. So you get 10 bases here, 10 bases here, 10 bases here. But then the next time it comes around, maybe you're offset by another three or four bases. Now you get 10 bases, 10 bases, 10 bases. And you do that multiple times, and now all of a sudden you have a pretty complete sequence. So strobe sequencing is the sort of fancy thing that you can do with, with the pack bio to get very long reads. And again, just like in, remember in solid, I said one of the great things about the error rates was that you were reading the same sequence multiple times. With strobe sequencing, particularly on, on circular templates, you, get that, you can get that same effect where, at least for some of the bases, you will have actually tried to get a call on them multiple times. Questions about that? How long is sequence? How long is long? Yes, good question. So it depends, is the short answer, right? So these are some, you know, I said, typical results, as it says on the PacBio website. You know, typical meaning this is the best one they'd like to show you. <laughs> um, what the output looks like, you know. Um, essentially, they like to tell you that whether, whether GC content is high or low, it doesn't matter. The read lengths are sort of the same um, from different, uh, so this is the average read, read length in, in yellow at about 3,000 bases. The 95th percentile is, so 95% of it is, is, is 8,000 base pairs or smaller. And the longest read lengths they're getting are in the you know, tens of kilobases. Okay? And this slide is a year and a half out of date, so it's probably better now. It's almost certainly better. This is a, definitely packed by as a technology where every probably nine or ten months or so they're coming out with a new upgrade to the chemistry and the, and the software and the enzyme to, to um, uh, yeah, and, and just to be fair, I haven't done justice to the, to the, to the technology and engineering that went into this, this enzyme. They've also done things to make it kind of laser, you know, laser stable. Um, they slowed the processing, the, the processivity down, and there's something else they did too, if anyone remembers. Um, so that's about, that's about the size of this pore and the distribution of, of, of the pores on the, on, on the sheet such that they don't get the side scatter. Is that what you're talking about? The, the fluorescent side scatter? Oh, the physical orientation of the, of the laser, I see. Okay. <coughs> 20, 20 KB reads. Some 20 KB reads, not all, right? And so, so there's a real distribution here, right? Where, yeah, lots of them are reads. And certainly compared to Lumina, these are really super long reads. But they're not all 10,000 base pairs long. Some of them are 10,000 base pairs long, more like you know, 1,000, 2,000 base pairs long. Still, that's really great. Accuracy, different, different story, right? So we haven't talked yet about quality values, but essentially the higher these numbers are, the better. Um, so you know, as the coverage in that strobe sequencing increases, the, the, the accuracy goes much better. But if you only have one, you know, one or two times over the sequence, then your accuracy can actually be, be pretty poor, pretty poor in terms of what that sequence actually is. Um, and when we talk about genome assembly in a couple of days, this will come back into play. Because maybe sometimes for PacBio, you don't actually need to know exactly what the sequence is. You just need to know across 10,000 bases what I kind of think the sequence is here and what I kind of think the sequence is over there. Because then if I have a bunch of Illumina reads where I really actually know what the sequence is, I can kind of I can fill that in and I know the physical orientation of those reads because I can use this as a scaffold. Great, um, Oxford Nanopore is the last technology we're gonna talk about. So we're going from the, somebody asked me at, at dinner how big the pack bio machine is, and I have actually stood in front of one. It's, it's big, it's a really big How much machine. is it? How much is it? <laughs> I'm not, I, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot, they're all expensive. What did you say, Dan? 750. 750? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, Yeah. They bought two of them. Yeah. 
the question is if they are changing whatever they are changing every nine months, how do people keep up with the 750,000 pieces of equipment? The machine's not changing. The, the reagents and the chemistry and the, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the consumables change. Yeah, yeah. So, so the razor blade handle itself stays the same, but the, but the razor blades that you have to plug onto it get better. Okay, great. Question, so you just said that with the aluminum machine, you would prefer some of these because you have a lot of them because of shorter reasons. And for some of the genes, and this is just an example that seems to come up a lot, with <coughs> pseudo genes in cannabis too, it seems like there is an example, the PAC-5 would be a good machine to, to sequence that in particular because of the pseudo gene. How, does, how can you make up for that with alumina where you have shorter reads? Yeah, so when we talk about both, so we're, we're going to talk about assembly, we're going to talk about kind of figuring out the structure of a piece of, of DNA or a piece of, of, of RNA, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yep. <coughs> okay, so other end of the spectrum, these things are really tiny. Okay, so here is the, is the um, min-ion contraption, here's the, essentially the hardware, and then here's the flow cell that you would exchange with each sample that you, that you, that you squirted in. Um, and just, it's just a US, you know, just, this is it. This is the sequencer right here. This is the whole thing. This little box. This is the consumable that you have to, to replace. Um, I'm sorry, what? How big is this? Well, so here's the computer and here's the USB port. So it's, it's like as big as a thumb drive. It's that big. And so what is in this, so, so this, uh, this, this, this thing here, this, uh, this flow cell, this flow cell that fits in here, right? So, so you put this thing down and then you flip the cover shut and then you plug it in and you push the big red easy go button. Okay, but what is in this thing? What's in this thing are um, an array of nanopores and every one of those nanopores is coated with um, an, 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 an alpha hemolysin hexamer. Now, why alpha hemolysin? Alpha hemolysin is, is one of many, many proteins that just likes to make a pore in a kind of, li you know, in a, in a fatty lipid membrane. So essentially you have a fatty lipid, uh, you know, polymer membrane with all of these little, um, little holes that then the, um, the, the alpha hemolysin makes, makes hexamer pores in. And the idea is that these pores can then be channels through which things can or cannot move through. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, so here's the idea. Now across that membrane, across, you know, from the top to the bottom of the membrane, you have some sort of electric potential, right? Some kind of voltage difference. So when the pore is open, there's current flow. But if some other molecule floats into the pore, it can disrupt the current flow in various ways. It can either decrease the overall current flow. It can, based on its, on its sort of, um, on how much time it spends sitting in the pore, or not sitting in the pore, or clogging the pore, it can change both the, the, the so-called depth and the dwell time, right? Because there's essentially two axes here that it, can, that it can change. But essentially, any molecule as it interacts with this pore, either by just blocking the pore, by moving through the pore, by getting stuck in the pore and then coming out of it again, um, any interaction will essentially lead to a, a blip in the, in the in the voltage in the in the in the current, uh, and th so these are these are picoamps. So uh, you know, 50 picoamps is essentially the kind of baseline current, and then deltas on this. Anytime you interrupt the pore, lower the the current through here. All right. So that is sort of a start. That's a starting point. How do we get to sequence though? Because essentially, what does this little blurb, you know, those are blips have to do with sequence? Well, the idea is, and I guess. Yeah, I guess you see it here a little better. So if you have a double-stranded DNA sequence and you, if you can get that DNA sequence to, to unwind with a, with a you know, helicase or, or you know, some kind of reaction where you can make it, or, or just, just, you know, just like in an in a electrophoretic gel, just, to, you know, just using the electric potential to drive the molecules. The only way they can get through from one side to the other is to go through the pore, and the pore is only big enough to allow single-stranded DNA to go through. So once you get that going, it'll start going, and that, and that, and that DNA sequence will, will unzip, and the single strand will, will move through. As it moves through, each base 
is going to lead to a little bit of, so this is essentially a trace of as each base goes, goes by. Um, it turns out that the bases, that you don't actually get a sort of punctate readout of individual bases. You get, because it, it kind of slurps, through. it's not this constant motion. It's sort of like two or three slurp through, and then the next three or four slurp through, and then two or three slurp through. And at each one of those slurps, there's a, a different delta. Well, um, people much smarter than I am can actually calculate the predicted um, amperage change for any particular, so in this case, they're looking at, at you know, kind of codon size, tri, trinucleotide um, sequences. You know, so for all 64 uh, possible um, trinucleotides, they can calculate the expected delta. And then we're going to talk tomorrow about hidden Markov models over and over and over and over again. But this is a, a first kind of gentle introduction. Very much like when we talked about base space or color space to base space, we said, all right, if we knew what the first one was, then that actually helps us understand what the next one was because there to, has to be overlap. And the same thing here, if we see a particular uh, delta that seems to correspond, you know, if we see a delta around here of, of, of 250, um, then, you know, maybe it's this guy, but maybe it's this guy and maybe it's that guy because these have some big error bars on them. But it's certainly not these guys and it's certainly not these guys, right? I've at least narrowed my, from 64 possible different trinucleotides, I've narrowed myself down to sort of three or four. And then as I go from this spike to the next spike to the next spike, you know, as I bounce around, I can essentially find a path where I say, oh, well, the most likely one of these three was actually the GTC because the next, most likely the next one is the TCG and those two are compatible with each other. So I can find some, remember earlier today when Bill was, had the, 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 the graph, the path graph, and he said we could go this way or we could go this way, and if we got here, which are the various ways we could have gotten here? And you did plus ones and minus twos and you used scores to figure out. Same thing here, but instead of using scores, we can use probabilities. We can say <coughs> what's the probability of getting to a TCG um, given that we used to be in a GTC, given that we observed a particular, uh, a particular uh, amperage that, that corresponded to those numbers. And then having done that, we can then say, ah, well, the sequence is G, T, C, G, T. And we can read off the sequence from there. So that's how it works. Any, any questions about nanopore? Yeah. Error rates, yeah. Very, yeah. Uh, sort of yeah. Really it does, it does. And in fact, one of the one of the topics of conversation at the Genome Informatics meeting, uh, I think it's actually tomorrow night, is all about talking about nanopore errors and how to model them and fix them and do them better. So yeah, and it's just a very active field of, of research right now. Super cheap, super cheap, because essentially the, um, you know, these things are, are cheap to make. I think the expensive part is this um, integrated electronic circuit. So essentially sitting underneath every one of these things, again, has to be the, you know, um, the, the, the circuit that senses the change in the, in the voltage at that one pore distinct from the pore next to it. Um, so yeah, but again, it's, you know, it's solid state circuitry, you know, it's, Kind of, you know, it's like Radio Shack stuff. It's, you know, so so no, I mean, I, I don't, I I, th I think these things are like are like a hundred bucks. I was told they were the device was a thousand dollars, and then the, each one of the um, components was like a yeah, flow flow cells. Is what? A thousand bucks. So uh, it's like. Okay. But you can run it for forty-eight hours um, total runtime. So depending on how many reads you need. And yeah, time, yeah. So cheap. so that's right. I haven't I haven't talked about that, but. You know, right, so, so, so once you've loaded sample onto this, the sample is, is on there, but you can essentially, you know, once one read, once one piece of DNA is done going through this pore, another piece of DNA can come along later and go through that pore. So each of the pores is essentially reusable for some amount of time. Um, so you can essentially just keep sequencing without, so there are no reagents, right? You know, there, there's no, um, we're not actually doing any, sequencing by synthesis or sequencing by, by, by hybridization. We're just essentially observing the molecules. Okay. So here's a graph I show every year. 
And of course, you know, well, actually, no, I, I don't show it every year. I, we only started showing it in about 2009 or so. So in 2009, we were there, and it was all very exciting because that we thought, wow, that slope is like that. Okay? And then things slowed down, and then things slowed down. And then the last couple years, I got really pessimistic and said, look, this slope is, you know, in, in a few, you know, in, in another, what, five years, we're going to be here, and we're going to just match up to where we were before. Um, and I was very pessimistic, and I drew lines here. But now look, 2015, Oxford, Nanopur, and PacBio, and also Lumina continuing to be driven in their, in their pricing wars, we're going to start going down again. So I, I don't know whether, whether we're going to get this particular slope that we got there, because that was pretty, pretty exciting, um, but something in the middle. But, but my, my former pessimism that, that, that you've never heard, but some of the lecturers have I've heard, it has now been erased by this one dot. <laughs> so we'll see next year. Come back next year. Um, pay the big money to come back one more time so you can see again whether next year it goes here or whether that was just an anomaly and we go back to a flat, a flat curve. These, you know, people love to talk about these curves. They're very motivational. They talk about how, we're, you know, what, you know, how is this going to transform science as we are able to sequence at, you know, more deeply for any given sample. You know, forget about doing 20 million. You know, so we're going to talk about RNA-seq. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk about how many reads do I need per library. Well, if sequencing continues to go down another order of magnitude, and then another order of magnitude, and then another order of magnitude, well, yeah, if the sequencing costs five bucks, then I'm going to do a lot more samples, and I'm not going to just get 20 million reads. I'm going to get 500 gazillion reads, and I'm going to know about every last rare isoform, and isn't, you know, isn't thing, everything's going to be lovely. Well, we'll talk about that too. Yeah, you certainly need to process the data. Whether you need to store every last bit of it is, is an interesting question. Um, we're going to talk about that later, later tonight when, when, when we talk about CRAM. Um, but is anyway. Is there an interpretation graph? Is there what? There's an interpretation graph because it goes the other way, right? I mean, the cost. Right? That's, yeah, yeah, the cost of, of interpretation. I mean, one way I look at this is, is the sequence is really just the signal, right? Um, and the fact is that the cost of generating the signal is decreasing. And having more signal, yes, there may, you know, that, that, that drives storage costs and it drives interpretation costs. But at the end of the day, the questions are, remain the same. And so answering the questions, uh, I think, is, is what, what the focus should, should be on. OK. So uh, you all know this. There's lots of things we can do with genome resequencing. Um, you've, already told us about it in all of your different um, discussions. So that's our break. I actually got through that very quickly.